Hey, everyone. Hi. Hello. Welcome to another exciting episode of Allison Rosen is your new best friend. I'm overjoyed to bring in our guest in a few moments. It's someone that I always enjoy having on the show. You guys have heard me talk about this person before. But first, I must catch up with the self-professed bad boy of podcasting, Tony Thaxton. Hello. Hello, self-professed <laughs> uh, queen of segues. You know, if we're going to call, un- call out nicknames, then uh, I'm throwing it right back at you. Have you ever met someone who's better at segues than I am? Touche. Mm-hmm. Touche. So A, B, I'm not 100% sure that that was self-professed. Greg Heller may have called me that. Someone else may. I mean, I feel like my talent with segues, specifically segues into an ad read, is so off the charts that someone else might have deemed me anointed me queen of segues and and i'm sorry to have to get so nasty right off the bat tony <laughs> but i think that i might have acquiesced to it being self-professed to make you feel better because we know for sure uh-huh. bad boy of podcasting yeah. is self-professed okay. mm-hmm. yeah i'm sorry sure. i didn't want it to come out this way but i just i don't know what has gotten into me <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> it's going all right. Um, I had something that happened a couple weeks ago that I've been going to tell on the show because it was real crazy. I'll, I'll try and give the very quick version because I feel like I usually don't have any stories to tell. So let me give you this very quickly. I'll do it as quick as I can. A couple weeks ago, I went out to a bar uh, and was hanging with a couple of friends. And first of all, this is a little side note of the of the story. It was it was the uh, it was they had the dodger game on this was a few weeks ago when they were still in the playoffs and if Mm -hmm. they won the if the dodgers won this game they would be going to the next round of the playoffs and this bar we were at was also setting up for karaoke and it was literally two outs bottom of the ninth the dodgers were winning by one and you know the game almost over and people are there watching the game and then suddenly the bartender gets on the microphone is like, we're going to turn off the game now and start karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> was there like one person who's like, yes. <laughs> well, weirdly, there kind of was a karaoke crowd. So like people surprisingly cared less than I thought they were going to. But I was like, come on, like 30 seconds. Give it like yeah. 30 seconds is all you need. People- anyway demand did you say anything i'm gonna guess you didn't no i mean i was one of the people that was like what come on like they did leave it on one of the tvs but they just had the sound off then and, right but yeah literally it was like 30 seconds later i mean i think um, i've talked before about i don't enjoy karaoke wait you do enjoy karaoke though right if i'm in the right mood yeah because my theory was because i played in a band i don't need to karaoke but those right. might be separate. I do not it, like karaoke. I don't like private room karaoke. Like I have no interest in karaoke and I'm happy that I don't get a lot of invitations to do it anymore. I did go on a date with a guy. To, oh my God. It's almost a trend. I went on two, two separate dates with guys where they brought me with them to watch them karaoke. Oh yeah. That's not, that's not a good, uh, no. these were first dates. It was, a second date with one of them and it was a first date i don't even think it was a date it was like <laughs> this guy that i had this ongoing flirtation with in new york did i mention that i used to live in new york i don't bring it up that much um and then we left a party to go to another bar he chose the bar and it was a bar that had karaoke and like he they knew him he had his special song and i was like i couldn't be less interested in this wow that uh yeah that's not that's not a great move note to future Um, suitors should my marriage go south (laughs) don't bring me karaokeing i won't be taken with it uh well that that kind of sort of ties in where this is going so oh did i cut you off oh uh, yeah i I mean queen of segways segued too early it's fine sorry because this was really this was really the point of the story then the Dodger thing was a side note uh (laughs) so at one point once the karaoke has gone one of my friends had gone up to the bar and when he came back, this girl was with him. And and this friend has a girlfriend. He wasn't like doing anything, you know, shady or anything. He was just being friendly. And, and this girl was by herself at the bar and she had sang a song already. And and he was like, hey, we're, hey if you want to come sit with us or whatever. And uh, and so this girl comes and sits with us. And he's like, hey, guys, this is and I'll call her Sally for the sake of the. Uh, this is Sally. Uh, she's going to hang out with us. All right. And she seemed nice and everything and uh, hung out for a bit. Whatever. That was that was the night. 
the following morning, I uh, am up and I look. I've been on dating apps, but like only kind of, sort of lately. I just every now and then will look at them. And I opened this dating app, and that exact girl, a couple of days prior, had liked me on the dating app. And and literally even added the comment, like, this is a face I'd like to see across from me at a bar. Oh, that's then, so like, weird. Two days later, this happens. Wait, was that what do you make of this? Is that coincidence or was she, is she like really playing the long game and being very subtle about it? What's going on? Did she realize it was you? No, because then like I, I did send a message to her and she was like, she's like, whoa, this is really crazy. She was like, she's like, yeah, I sent that before we met the other night. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I, I realized. That's but, really weird. But when she met you, she wasn't like, oh, you're that face. She no. was across from the face in the bar and she didn't put it together. No. But I mean, also, like, so uh, would, would you if uh, I feel like I don't know if a, a normal person would like you just see well, I, I'm not a normal briefly, person. And then, well, that's true. Uh, and I said I talked over you. I didn't hear what you just said. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I think I I like to think I would, but I don't really know. Yeah, I just feel like like quickly, casually seeing a couple of photos of somebody. Like I don't know that it would like register later if I saw this random person. So are you and Sally now an item? No, uh, I talked to her briefly. I haven't talked to her much more than that. I don't know. It was just it was just a crazy thing. I uh... this is my theory. I was never on the apps. Mm -hmm. But there were like dating websites back yeah. back in my day. Uh, and my theory is they just deliver you people you already know. Hmm. I, I've definitely seen a few people pop up here and there yeah. that I that I knew, but like not too many. Hmm. Well, Tony, once again, I'm sorry that I cut off your story. It's, it's fine. I, I'm I thought sorry that, to I our thought... guest that I feel like this went on longer than I planned for. So You do owe our guest a massive apology. Okay, you guys, I am so excited to welcome back to the show comedian, actor, writer, director, person I love to talk to, and someone who is starring in a documentary about his show and friendship, tumultuous friendship with Dana Gould. It is. Welcome to the show. Please put your hands together for Bobcat Goldthwait. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Queen of Segways. Oh, thank I, uh, you. Yeah. And you got I to just, hear it in I, action. I could just, uh, it's, I only could think of Paul uh, Blart when you were saying Queen of Segways. Wasn't that what he's on a Segway? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a deep cut. I, uh, I, and I really didn't know where that was going, Tony, when you said, isn't this a face I'd like to see? And I thought it'd be like looking up at me. I don't know where. It was. <laughs> I thought it was going to be much more blue. No, uh, we're working clean here. Tony owes you an apology. Yeah. Well, Do it, Tony. Why? Why do you owe me an apology, Tony? I feel like uh, the the story. I I tried to keep the story short, but I feel like it went on a little longer than. There's uh, not than that I... many people going. Damn it! Let's get to Bob Scratch Goldfarb. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree. I, 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 I'm ready. I don't want to hear about your karaoke dating life. Um, <laughs> I uh, karaoke. Yeah, that's horrible. I I, I that's the, it's not it's never good. It's just not. It, yeah, I don't. I I agree with you, Allison. I I'm not down with it. This is why in another life we're together. I know. You know, I really <laughs> together we're, we're together not karaokeing. I wish I had my shit together and had a picture of you hanging on the wall. That would have been really, <laughs> oh, would have been really that would have been really creepy. Hey, hi. How are you? Oh my god. <laughs> but you know what? I I have discovered recently that I am like really good at taking compliments. This has been a topic that's come up now on a couple different shows because a lot of people, if you give them a compliment, they demure and they're, they're like, oh, no. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I feel like... But what that's I'm healthy. That's the right response. When you say, when you deflect, you're either saying, you're, what you're, the subtext there is, oh, you thought that was good. I'm, I'm actually amazing or you know what i mean or you're you well, know it's it's a big I, ego actually when you when you act when you deflect the compliment i that was my theory and i said it in front of someone who later revealed that she's a compliment defect deflector so then i felt like uh oh but my theory is that if you deflect you're actually asking for the person to do another lap yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You thought that was good? You know, after a show early on, I realized doing stand-up that I could find 
someone to say nice things about me. And I could also easily find people that thought I was horrible and the worst thing. So I just kind of made a decision to not, not, not listen after the shows and just, Mm -hmm. you know, be my own barometer of how I did well or didn't do well. In that's, that's so good. In Joyride, you make a comment about how you don't rely on, like, you don't need the audience's validation. You get I actually jotted it down, but it's going to take too long for me to No, You know what? I'm going to find it so I can find the exact, the exact wording. Um, let me see here. Okay. Oh yeah. Your merit as a human being is tied to what kind of human being you are. Yeah. It's not based on if an audience likes me or not. You know, if, 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 if you don't go out and eat shit on stage, Odds are you're not doing anything that should be on stage. Do you know what I mean? Like you're just you're just pandering to the masses and just being really boring. So uh, look, I got I still got it. The the kid can still gut a room. You know, <laughs> Dana, Dana and I were Dana and I were in Texas, and uh, there was this guy. His name was Caleb Wallace. He was an anti vaxxer and mm-hmm. he had. He had his freedom rallies and his anti-mandate rallies and all that stuff. And he, he, of course, got COVID. He ended up in a hospital and he mm. died. And, oh. um, and I was like, it's sad because he, well, part of his story, his wife's pregnant and mm. they have three kids. And I go, it's such, a, it's sad. It's sad because I didn't get to watch him die. Um, I really wish I was in that hospital and uh, yanked the hose out of his throat and said, <laughs> hey, you know what? If you don't believe in medicine, you don't get to go to the magic medicine building on your way out and take a bed from people who really need it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we were in Texas, not far from where this guy died. People just got up. There. And I'm just going, just make sure you tip your weight staff and, and settle up your bar bill, you know. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I still have that Goldthwaite magic of gut in a room. <laughs> have you have you always, though, felt that your merit doesn't come from your relationship with the audience? And have you always felt that if you're not, you know, turning them off in some way, you're not doing something interesting? Well, it's not it, it maybe not not turning them off. But but I, you know, as a kid, I was always kind of. You know, nothing is what it seems. And, mm-hmm. and and so I always kind of, maybe I was cynical, but, you know, you'd see somebody who's portraying a wholesome dad, and that was always a red flag. You know, I always knew the more wholesome someone was, the odds are they weren't good people, which sounds really bitter and cynical, but but I was right, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, and and uh, I was ego surfing, and Pat and Oswald said, uh, uh, Bobcat Goldthwait's been saying Bill Cosby's a rapist on stage for 20 years. And, and I had, mm-hmm. I, I just didn't know it was true. I got lucky. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you were just saying that because he projected such a wholesome image. No, because he, because he did, uh, uh, expose himself to my friend Marianne, who's a costume oh. designer. So I knew that he was a creep, but before that I still was pretty much bashing it. But you know, I, I don't think I'm, I don't really celebrity bash, Anymore, like I, that's something that's not in the documentary. Just as I, I made a decision to jettison this character that I no longer related to, and and felt uh, it felt dishonest doing it. And even if there was people that were coming to see it, I had a I had to jettison it. But another thing before that was I said I have to jettison uh, celebrity bashing because it doesn't make me feel good mm-hmm. and. But but then when we were filming Joyride, that's when like uh, uh, Seinfeld on his uh, show, uh, rich comedians talking about comedy till it's not funny anymore <laughs> in cars. Hey, that's my show. I mean, not rich comedians, but <laughs> <laughs> but but so you know he went. Out, he he was trying to make my friend Bridget Everett the best I can tell, trying to make her feel bad for saying she likes me, and and. And uh, it was really ugly and weird how how upset Jerry did. Now, here's the thing. Jerry Seinfeld should be mad. I was vicious to that guy for years, but I had stopped doing it for 20 years. Mm-hmm. So so when he did that, it was kind of like, I feel like in a Western where the, the gunslinger's retired and then Jerry shows up in the town square. It's like, Goldthwaite. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I'm out of the game, man. You don't want to do this, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to put my 45s on and. I'm like, but, you know, 
to quote Alice Cooper, my shots are lethal, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I, I put my toe back into the celebrity bashing a little bit in the documentary, which is funny because one of the things I say is I go, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld's biggest talent is being Larry David's friend. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, you know, Larry David goes off and creates Kirby Enthusiasm, and Jerry does a, a show in a car with a fucking GoPro, and then, uh, that's what I say, and then we just cut to our movie where it's Dana and I just <laughs> sitting in a car, <laughs> but we're not talking. Uh, you know, so I'm aware of, of that there might be a little bit of similarity, but I don't think so. I think, I think Dana and I, the, the stuff in the car on purpose, I put the cameras behind us. So mm-hmm. you would actually one, so we wouldn't be performing for cameras and two, so the, the viewer would feel like they were in the back seat. Come on. Yeah. With a bunch of comics. Well, I, I, and I, I want to get into that, but what, but first I'm just curious, what was or, when you first started bashing Jerry Seinfeld, what was your issue with him? <laughs> oh, I, I, uh, if I really got down to it, it yeah. was, uh, I think that it just how he slighted me when I was a young comedian. He's oh, very rude. But then later on in life, I build up this case against him where I'm like going, ah, oh, he's banging an underage girl mm-hmm. and he's, he's, uh, I call him a Scientologist, which isn't true. He's a Scientologist enthusiast because he, because <laughs> I guess he solicited some of the classes. I don't know how long oh. he was involved, but he I still goes on. I he goes know. on record saying it's a really great organization. It really helps people. I didn't know there was an oh, option wow. to dabble in it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, they <laughs> let him out. I don't know. It's all so, or nothing. Yeah, yeah. But what, uh, in so, what way did he slight you? Oh, I just remember I, I. Uh, I got off stage and people were kind of happy that I was there. I was at the improv. And then his, I was walking out and then his girlfriend, uh, <laughs> was, 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 or date, whatever, was, was nice, excited. And then, uh, he, he stormed off. And then later on, I heard that he had been saying a lot of crap because I wasn't a stand up. I wasn't, you know, I was making, I wasn't, you know, a traditional stand up, you know, heaven forbid, I wasn't trying, sweating at home, trying to craft the perfect joke about where sweaters go <laughs> <laughs> or, or socks go in the dryers or, or shopping for the best sweater to go on stage. You know, mm-hmm. I always had a real problem with dating comics who would go on stage talking about dating. Cause it was just like, you know, really, you should just go. I'm stunted maturity. I have stunted maturity, and I, 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 I don't listen, and I'm, uh, I, I can't find a, a mindless hot zombie. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's what they're all looking for? Is that what you uh, were looking for? You know, well, I think I probably would have dated more if I had shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I tell you? So you were you were on my show probably like I want to say twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, and then again in I think twenty fifteen, and then now unless there's an episode I'm somewhere else that I'm forgetting. But I had interviewed Kevin Connolly when I worked at Time Out in New York. I interviewed Kevin Connolly for a movie that he made, and he jokingly but potentially is still bitter that he yeah. wasn't he dating Nikki Cox and then yes. she started dating and then you. I did. But you know, I actually spoke with him uh uh twice and uh and and and, and it feels like we're we're on good terms. Okay, good. So, but <laughs> but the first time I spoke with him and he, by the way, he has every right to be uh uh, uh not happy. Uh but Did you steal her out from under I, him? I, 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 I well, yeah, like I'm like <laughs> I got an ass got on and a thing of roses, <laughs> and, but I uh, it wasn't cool. Let's just say that. So, okay. but but then time goes by and neither of us are with her. And uh, and uh, I I say I think to my I run into him. I go I need to apologize for my behavior. But but I should also say uh, the time that I decided that I needed to apologize for my behavior was. When both of us were the only two people in a gun range firing guns. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, this could go, this is either going to go well or, or, uh, I'm going to be on E True Hollywood. 
That's crazy. You guys were both at the same gun. Ra- this is more yeah. coincidental than Tony and the woman who loves his face but didn't recognize it. <laughs> yeah, I love your face so much that I don't recognize it. <laughs> that's that's pretty. That's pretty. Uh, I kind of think that was a line. I want to see you across. Yeah, but so yeah, we we hashed it out. Well, we both had uh, firearms. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that takes restraint. I think that again, it's these cowboy metaphors, but yeah. yeah. Are you do you are you a a a gun shooting enthusiast? Uh I like uh I have a couple of revolvers. I like shooting my revolvers. Uh but I I don't have any I don't think that in the at the end of times I'm going to be defending myself or, or my weapon of choice for a burglar is a baseball bat. It's not it's like I don't see these guns. These guns are just fireworks that i get to hold in my hand you know mm-hmm. look I, I you know i i'm a progressive with a gun you know uh and, and by the way when the shit goes down all the other progressives are going to come to my house because <laughs> i'll be the only one back and eat <laughs> you can defend the rest of the progressives <laughs> yeah they'll all come in under my arms like uh baby ducklings <laughs> <laughs> um so let's talk about Joyride. This is a documentary film that you made with Dana Gould. I didn't realize till I watched it that you and Dana were not friends at the at the beginning of your careers. We weren't friends, but one thing that I don't think's in in the movie is that it didn't. We didn't hash it out. We I I was really cruel to that poor guy for years. In the movie, it just looks like because he says. We didn't like each other when we met. And I'm like, that's not true. I hated you when we met. And then and Dana's like, well, I hated me. So we had that in common. So, <laughs> so uh, I was vicious to that guy for that guy, for uh, Dana for years. Mm-hmm. And I, when I found footage of me actually being really mean to him on stage, I, I put it in the movie. Like I knew I, I needed to be the protagonist in this movie if I was going to have a little bit of a narrative. And sadly- The uh, antagonist? Yeah. Oh, did I say protagonist? I'm yeah. sorry. Antagonist. Yeah. So I had to be, <laughs> secretly I'm the protagonist. <laughs> right. Right. I'm the I'm the Secretly I role. do ag- agree with your compliments, but I don't, but I do, but I don't. Well, let's break it down. A protagonist is the character that actually grows in the course of the movie. So or story. So the reality of it is, is I guess I am the protagonist because I'm the one that that starts off with this place, and then I I, I realize I'm I, I do the growing because I apologize. So maybe I am the protagonist. I think you are. But I uh, but when that scene comes in a theater where I'm being really vicious to him on stage, I can't buy a laugh in the theater for another ten minutes. Like people do not like me, and uh, 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 I'm glad I put it in it. Do you kind of like when people don't like you? No, I I want to be loved by everybody, like everyone does. I I don't I don't feed on that, and I don't go uh, the haters. You know, I don't I don't enjoy that. But sometimes, you know, like right now, I'm uh, I'm a meme because of some things I said about cancel culture, and and um, you know, at the end of the day, here's what's here's what's going on. There's a marginalized group that are being murdered. And they have a high rate of suicide. So at the end of the day, if you're asking me whose side am I going to be on, a billion-dollar corporation and a multimillionaire comedian, I'm going to be on the marginalized group. And if you know, and if you can't figure out, you have a problem with their lifestyle or all this stuff, it's I I don't care. Just cram it, you know. Yeah. You, you know. And there is no cancel culture. It's this idea. It's and people got mad that I said that, and it's like. I equated it to back in the day, there would be uh, the the morning shock jocks and and they would be getting taken down. The FCC is is going after them and the and the (laughs) and their sponsors or or management. And they would say, oh, the man is giving it to me. And it made their fan base feel like they were victims and they were supporting a victim. But the reality of it is, these people just went on to make millions and millions and millions and more dollars. They might have to change up how they did it, but they did. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can convince people you're a victim, you can make money off of it. And we're totally the only real in cancel culture. The only real victim is the survivors and the whistleblowers because people figure out a way to still 
rip off gullible people that think they're supporting some uh some outsider and they're not you know and 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 uh yeah so i'm on my i'm preaching right now but i you know i just i agree feel, with you though but i feel like at the end of the day i would love it if everybody said nice things about me but the reality is when i take that opinion i i'm i have to say well why am i saying this and the truth of the matter is 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 i i'm I'm on the side of people who are getting murdered. And that's a side that I think everybody should be on. Yeah. Like whenever I weigh in, I don't weigh in all the time. I don't make, you know, I'm not on Twitter and I'm not like finding a cause to say my pithy thing on any given day. I I tend to weigh in when I don't see other people doing it, you know, and and then, then I do. But the rest of the time, I don't, you know, I don't want to fight with Carl uh, 27 Oakley wear for life as I say in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it is nuts. It is nuts how these people who, uh, who say that they're being censored, they're being canceled. Then you'll look at their Patreon and it's like, you're making $72,000 a month. Like my God. <laughs> yeah. You're being, or, as or, Dana says, you know, I'm being, uh, they're, they're, they've got a muzzle on me and listen to my podcast muzzled. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, <laughs> Yeah, or these you guys know. who who got me tooed, uh, and I love that that's now a verb. But they'll you know they'll like go fallow for however many months, pop up, and then suddenly they they'll post on Instagram, and there's like 693 comments in a second, and it's a bunch of other. It's very they have people rally around them. It's kind of yeah. nuts. I yeah, think you so nailed it on the not, head. It's not so. It's you know uh, if you say something and. Other people get. I think that's a. I think that's where where Seinfeld kind of lost his mind was because, you know, he he made a homophobic joke and was just shocked that marginalized group weighed in and said, "Hey, we don't like that," and that was brand new to him. The idea that people <laughs> may not, you know, look. There's people that don't like what I say and do. Obviously, what I'm talking about making a joke, being glad that Caleb Wallace <laughs> died. <laughs> But the reality of it is, is if I heard from any of his people or anything like that, I would double down or I'd apologize. But I wouldn't say I'm being persecuted by mm-hmm. the man. Yeah. Well, They're so a bunch of babies. Uh, you know. So what do you make then of comedians who are like, I it's so scary right now. I feel like I could get canceled. I f- I'm afraid to, <laughs> you know, be myself on stage. I could get canceled any minute. It's like really bad out there. What's happening to comedy? All that hand wringing. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think what the uh, <laughs> I feel my comment to them is good. Maybe you should look <laughs> at your act. Maybe you should look at your behavior, you know. Uh, you know, I often hear people going, what would George Carlin say? You know, he, he couldn't have said what he said, said, but you know, I know exactly what George Carlin would have said. He would write a really hilarious bit about what a whiny bitch you are. <laughs> and he would call you out on your bullshit because now you're acting like you're the, the victim, you know? Right. Uh, uh, you know, George said a lot of things that, uh, would be considered shocking and, and, and people would raise an eyebrow, but he would double down on it or apologize. But I guarantee you he'd be making fun of these babies. Has, have you ever gotten flack for things you've said where you felt like that isn't fair? From, uh, a little bit, but 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 I have to just consider the source, and I usually don't address it. You know, if right. someone finds a bit that I do, um, you know, I tell that that airplane story, and 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 I don't. Oh yeah. And people get upset by that, but I I know my heart's in the right spot when I say it, so I'm not going to apologize. You know, the first time I ever did that story, uh. It was like I ten minutes into my act, and I was with my I was with Robin Williams was my buddy, and he was there, right? So this woman stands up and she's drunk, and she's like says that I'm horrible and all this stuff, and she storms out of the club and she starts walking towards a door, and that door is locked, so that she had to walk back through the club, and she really thought people were gonna leave with me, and she's yelling at leave with her and and she's yelling about you know what a horrible person I am and and her friends stayed, and I go, I go, did she leave? And they go, yeah. I mean, I go, is she really good gone? And they go, yeah. And I go, okay, uh, I'm not going to do my act. And the crowd's like, Rrr. and then I was like, uh, 
uh, please welcome uh, my friend Robin Williams. And so Robin went up. <laughs> he did my allotted time. He did about 50 minutes. Wow. And then I came up and I got him off. And I go, hey, let's hear for Robin. And I said to the woman's friends who stayed, I go, so when she asks what happened after I left, can you tell her that Robin Williams did a show? <laughs> <laughs> I I really hate hard. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, what made you guys decide to do Joyride to make a make a special? We we initially we got on stage together. We would go out, flip a coin, see who was going to headline, and then we realized people seem to like it more when we're just on stage flipping the coin and talking about whatever. So we kind of jettisoned our acts early on and just would stay up on stage. And it's not like a Martin Lewis act. Uh, I don't think one of us is the dumb guy. Maybe not unless Dana didn't tell me. Sounds like what um, the dumb guy would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dumb guy would know. So, yeah, maybe uh, uh, <laughs> I'm the shimp. Uh, so, so what happened was, is I was like, oh, we should film this. And then uh, there was the car accident. And then, but then we went back to film it. And, then the pandemic hit. So I instead of just picking the best show and cutting it into a special, I now could have the time with the editors to look at all the material and then all uh, go back through our lives, go back through our history. Is, uh, you know, I have a breakdown basically on TV and he has one that's more, uh, you know, internalized, but it's around the same time. Just to go, uh, so I was able to make a documentary versus just a straight stand up special. And I find stand up, even if it's someone that's, uh, you know, somebody who's really brilliant, I still, there's a fatigue at the 40 minute mark. And I hope that our movie kind of uh, uh, avoids that because mm-hmm. you, you see footage and you hear about our lives and hopefully that's funny. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, it does get heavy, it does get dark, but the goal is always to make people laugh. Um, that's so interesting that you say there's a fatigue at the 40 mark, 40 minute mark. I had never, I'd never put that all together. That's something, is that something known in the industry or something that you yourself have experienced? I just kind of my own unscientific approach. But when I start getting squirrely, I look at my watch and I was like, oh yeah, the, it's just, you know, it's 40 minutes, even if someone's brilliant. I think the only person I saw that avoided that was I saw Andy Kaufman, and it was just like this onion. He comes out speaking gibberish, and then he's doing Elvis, and then he's speaking kind of like that character, and he's wrestling women, and he's got bongos. And then at the end, he's got us all with our arms around each other singing uh, a, a kid's so- song. And and I, I think he, he clearly didn't uh, – that fatigue didn't set in. But. Mm-hmm. Let's <laughs> Let's but also, a, oh, go ahead. also his act, he was like, I think this would be a good time if I was wrestling women. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was comedy. <laughs> um, okay, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, I want to find out more about the car accident. And I want to find out whether you were truly a bully. I want to talk to you guys about Skylight Frame. Skylight Frame is a digital photo frame. It makes such a good gift. Before they were even a sponsor on this show, Daniel came to me and he's like, I know what we should get the grandmas for. It was either Mother's Day or Christmas this year. And he showed me this super nice digital frame. And I said, yes, let's do that. We gave it to them. My mom, who is not tech savvy, got it set up super fast. It sits on their fireplace. Uh, And then whenever we go visit Elliot, a four-year-old, and he was doing this even when he was younger than that, loves to like swipe through and look at the different photos. So what am I pointing those things out? I am saying it does not, you, anyone can set this frame up. Anyone can enjoy the frame. You can email photos to the frame. Uh, and it's just like a wonderful, we have one as well and it's in our office and I just love to sit there and to look at all the different memories that come up. Um, so it makes a great gift. I mean, I'd recommend buying one for yourself, Tony. You Me personally, one. right now, I'd right, recommend you. And I'm gonna get on the website and order one right now. I would recommend you personally buy one for yourself right now. Um, I bet you're wondering how to do that. Let me tell you. Yes, please. As a special offer, you 
can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter code Allison. That's right. To get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter code Allison. That's Skylight Frame, S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com, promo code Allison. Tony, did you do it? I Well, I mean, you... I you, I couldn't type that fast and get to the website, but I, I am going to do it. And I also want to make sure the listener knows when you said you do this, you weren't only talking to me. The listener can also do this. Yeah, but I want them to do be like Tony. That's what I'm always saying. Be like Tony. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, Words you're... of wisdom. <sighs> you know what else I want to tell them about? And Tony, this is also geared towards you personally. <laughs> This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. One way to think about therapy is with analogies. We get our cars serviced to prevent bigger issues down the road. We work out and visit the doctor to prevent injury and disease in our bodies. We see the dentist for our teeth to prevent cavities and other issues. I feel like you can probably understand therapy even without analogies, though. I'm a huge fan of therapy. (laughs) It has helped me immensely. Um, so many people I know are in therapy. I feel like if you're even the the tiniest bit open to it, do it. It, it will oh, help yeah. you. Did you say something? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tony of all people. Really? Really? Anyway, though, it can be hard in, in uh, this past what, 18 months now, going on 18 months, 19, two years. I don't know. The way we're living now, it can be tough to start up with a traditional therapist because they have just wait lists out the wazoo. That is where BetterHelp comes in. I have two friends right now who are doing BetterHelp. They are, they love it. They love the therapist. Uh, if you don't like the first therapist they match you with, you can actually, if you don't like, you can change therapists. You can ask for a new therapist as many times as you want, no extra charge. So they will get you to the right person. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Uh, It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Allison Rosen listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash best friend. That's betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash best friend. Okay, we're back. So I know that you and Dana got in a car accident. Here's the thing. Because I have publicly professed my love for one Bobcat Goldthwait, <laughs> people alert me of Bobcat. I, I, like, oh. I have my own Google alert set for you in the public. Also, many, many years ago, I wrote an article wrestling with my, at the time, love of the horrendous art of Thomas Kincaid. And for years, I would receive Thomas Kincaid paraphernalia. And I'm like, I don't like it anymore. So it's so it's you and Thomas Kincaid. It's not just you, but you oh, know, you, it's good. a special spot. But anyway, so I heard that you had been in a car accident and that you know, you, I, I knew you, you survived, but I didn't, I don't really know the details. So what happened? <laughs> you don't remember flying to my side? <laughs> and saying, <laughs> that would have been, please, no. <laughs> let's make it official before you, before you expire. No, I don't, I don't remember. I blacked out. I don't remember. But I, I actually don't remember any of the accident. I don't, don't remember anything uh, around that. I remember mm. being concerned about the little dog that was in the car, Bronx. He's a Frenchie. And I kept asking about, is Bronx okay? And I remember a little bit about that. And he was. He, he's passed on since. But if, oh. if he was sitting in the front seat and, and Dana was going to get in the front seat. And then he saw Bronx. And then he was like, no, no, no. Let Bronx sit in the front. So Dana's <laughs> low self-esteem saved his life because that dog just shot through the air like a ham. But uh, Dana would have been uh, killed probably. Right. But uh, so Bronx saved Bronx. his life. That's why the the movie's dedicated to him at the end. Huh. But um, it, when whose dog was Bronx? That was my assistant Emma's, and Bronx went everywhere with me. So people always thought Bronx was my dog. Uh, so uh, uh, I had a baby stroller for him, and I'd be oh. walking around the street in New York, and people would go, "What's their baby?" And they say, "You know, his, his little gross face." But I digress. Oh. So, so we're in the accident, and um, you were driving. I, no, no, oh. my assistant M was driving. Got it. And then, and then. Uh, 
we were pulling into the venue like idiots. We we could see the venue from our hotel. We could have we did not put our seatbelts on, and uh, and then crashed into each other. I had a concussion and broke three ribs. Dana broke two ribs, and because uh, I'm the headliner, I don't know why I have to tell you how I broke one more rib than him. <laughs> and then I got my You're memory tougher. back. I got my memory back. Yeah, I'm real tough. I got my memory back. I'm like a Fabergé egg in a cowboy hat. <laughs> and I got my memory back. And the, the funny thing was is that the they the they had signed me into the hospital, so they used my license, which says Robert Goldthwaite. And the doctor's like, "Where are you?" And I didn't know what city I was in. I didn't mm-hmm. know what state I was in. And then I. <laughs> Like on any given day, who knows what year it is when you go to fill out a check or something. That's it. Uh, so then he pulls out the big one, guns and he goes, what's your name? And I go, um, I'm Bobcat. And uh, <laughs> and he's like, you're, uh, you're Robert. And I go, no, I'm Bobcat. And he's like, your your name's Robert. And I'm like, I'm I'm. <laughs> I'm Robert. Like I was really hurt. <laughs> like I was in tears. I go to get the MRI and this this male nurse, he's like, he goes, you're Bobcat Coldplay. And I'm like, that's what I'm trying to tell him. <laughs> like, can you, tell, can you go tell that guy? Like, I really, it was, I was messed up. And even when I watched the documentary, when I watched Joyride, I can still see me trying to remember. Mm-hmm. You know? So I'm watching it and I'm like. And occasionally Dana would team me up to remind me of an old bit or a joke or something. And I didn't, it's, you know, it's really, it's like watching like, uh, Evan Costello. If, uh, if Lou Costello had, <laughs> had, had trauma. trauma. <laughs> yeah. These baseball players got a lot of crazy names. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> But head trauma, there's like all sorts of things that go along with it. Memory stuff. And then also, did you have emotional stuff afterwards? Yeah, I think I was, yeah, I was sad, but I was also, I was aware that I was thinking. Like, I was aware that Allison just asked me a question. You need to answer her. Then I would come, you know, so mm-hmm. so everything was an effort. Um, and you truly get in, I mean, I got into a place where I was just like, oh, this is how I'm going to, going to gonna live now you know and and it was uh, it's incredible like months later you you know and uh, and uh, now i don't have any of that anymore Mm -hmm. although it is weird just to know that there's these chunks that i don't remember did you have um anxiety about (laughs) driving or anything like that again the cure was the the because amnesia is always a plot device in sitcoms (laughs) Gilligan's Island, the doctor hit me on the head with a coconut and then right. I had, had memory again. Episode but, of um, Charles in Charge where he, I don't know, something happens and then he becomes Chaz and I think he hits his head again and then goes back to Charles. <laughs> really? See? Uh, that explains a lot about Scott Baio. <laughs> so, um, Someone bonk him on the head again. Yeah, yeah. Let's get Chaz back. Uh, so I had... Uh, uh, you were you were asking about uh, you, cars. If I'm if I'm weird about driving, anxious. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay, but uh, yeah, if like a car, if a car runs a light or anything like that, I'm a lot better. But I was, yeah, I would actually kind of freak out, and you know, I, I I'm sure my poor girlfriend had to deal with me yelping, but uh, I'm 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 better now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he says. And then I also wanted to know. You, so I read an interview in the Chicago Reader, and I think that's the same interview where you made the comments about cancel culture, which have been right. memefied, where you you were talking about you didn't like Dana Gould at the beginning because you <laughs> felt like he was not he was unoriginal. He was kind of imitating other comedians, specifically Tom Kenny, who's a good friend of yours. Yeah. And that also he was so weak. You made a reference to like him being weak and that like brought out the bully in you. Um, do you yeah. consider yourself a well, bully? I mean, were you, if you look at bully behavior, you know, you, you, you pick on, you know, pick on the big guy. Although sometimes I do, but, <laughs> but, uh, I was only ha- half kidding, but I was like Dana, I could tear apart and there was going to be no repercussions. You know, that's, that's the evil side of being a bully. I saw Dana as, you know, I always thought, well, here's a guy who who 
was derivative of Tom Kenny and some other people, and I'm going to call it out. I'm going to look like a hero, and I'm right, and they're wrong. But the reality of it is, is what I think why I really aimed the gun at him is Tom Kenny. I've known since I was six years old, folks who are listening, he's the voice of SpongeBob. He's done a million things. But Tom Kenny is the funniest person I've ever met in my life. And there's no way that I wasn't derivative of Tom. Mm-hmm. I know that sometimes I'll do an impression or do something and just me doing a version of Tom Kenny that I learned in fourth grade. So I think why you are what you hate, you know, you are what you mock, as Mel Brooks says. So I think I I didn't like that part of Dana that was me. And uh, and Tom Kenny saw me say that publicly and he's like, you didn't steal anything from me. And I was <laughs> like, oh, I think so. I, I think so. And then. He said some really nice things about me the other night. And I, it's just been very emotional. This whole week was just everywhere I went. It was just one really sweet, emotional uh, experience. Did you feel that Dana was, or rather, was he Harold? Did he have success very young that you felt was unearned? No, because I couldn't say that Dana had success at an a, a early age. It wasn't earned because I got on Letterman when I was 20. So there was a lot of people that were mad at me for being, so I would never assume that, you know, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it, you know, showbiz isn't based on m- merit and talent. There's also a good portion of luck. And, uh, but I, oh, you know what? I called the Letterman show cold when I was like 19 and I said, I'm a comedian. How do I audition? And they go, oh, we, we have auditions. And then I I took a bus down from Boston like 12 or 13 times. And I finally got on the show. Wow. It was really naive to just call up. But it worked. And, yeah. Th- 13 hey, this times is, later. <laughs> uh, 13, but, you know, by the 13th time, I truly hadn't, I didn't care if I did well or bad. I was, you know, I, I did. And then I got on the show, but it was, yeah, 13 times. But, you know, that's not bad. That's that's a baker's dozen to get mm-hmm. on a, a national TV show as a 20 years old. But Letterman didn't go. This next guy's 20 years old. He's like, this next guy is the weirdest comedian we've seen in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> were you were you like on with somebody? Oh, yeah. Crazy? Camping with Barry White Knight. <laughs> I was thinking so, that you had told me about somebody, somebody that you were on with or something. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm thinking. I, don't know I was on with of. the first time was camping with Barry White Knight, and then, um, yeah, uh, and I'm not sure who else I, was, but you know, I was on a handful of times. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm sorry for that interruption. That's Tony. You're allowed to talk. I, yeah, I know, but I, I thought I, years, I thought I was it's okay. taking it somewhere, but apparently not. I'm in, I'm insane. I mean, think twice before you do it again. But in general, you are allowed to talk. Don't get carried away. You need uh, to think about your ad libs, <laughs> young man. You better run them by. I need more ad libs. Yeah, could you please email them to me ahead of the show? All right, could and I will for approval. Um, Brush up on your <laughs> witty banter. Those uh, t- those twelve to thirteen times. Did they give you feedback? The auditions. Well, they didn't have to like. By the nature of what I was doing on stage, some nights I'd do real well, and then other times they would bring out like it'd be like the 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 you know the staff's assistants, and then they'd bring out the people, and then and then and then I would just tank because people would go, "What is this guy?" I remember just going on after Jim Carrey, you know, and he's dry. He's coming in from Toronto. I'm coming in from Boston. Jim Carrey's going up there, and he's doing Kermit the Frog, and he's doing. You know, he's singing the Rainbow Connection and on Golden Pond and and there's not a dry eye in the house. And then I come out in a leisure suit with mascara and, you know, I got a fish on stage. <laughs> <laughs> they would go, what the? They just thought a street person had come up and got on the open mic. So uh, it, it, you didn't have to point it out to me that I had bombed. It was pretty <laughs> obvious, the feedback. So, So you and Dana... You had this rocky beginning. You hated him at the beginning. And then at some point you became like legitimate friends, right? Yeah. It was probably around the time where I was deciding like, do I want to be right all the time or do I want to be happy? And I could start seeing people as allies. And instead of having a a Rolodex of anybody's imperfection, Mm -hmm. 
uh, I just a little more bend, you know, a little more, a little more, a little kindness, you know. How and, how uh, did that transformation happen? I, I it 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 was the fact that I was so angry all the time and so upset, you know. And I remember having a therapist who who asked me if I have anything. He thought I think he was trying to steer me towards making pottery. I had migraines that were, uh, they were visual. So mm. my eyesight would be all kaleidoscopy, kind of like the beginning of a uh, family affair. All, by the way, all my references, you can carbon date. They're all <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're ancient. But I, uh, and and uh, so I had these migraines. So I had to make a decision to either, uh you know, be be happy or 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 be in actual. It was it was actually blinding me. You know, blind mm-hmm. rage, as people say. So uh, I'd have to do some work on myself and uh, let all that go. And it still comes up now and then, but I, I choose my targets hopefully a little bit better. And instead of being mad at the whole world, I I, I just just go in there every once in a while, and it usually ends up being like. <laughs> Like a large corporation that could probably help my career. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's the kind of people other folks don't take on. Where do you think the ang- – where was the anger coming from when you were young? I don't know. That's funny because Tom Kenny and I, were, we were laughing about that. Like when, when we were teenagers, you know, Tom always – like we both liked garage bands and punk bands. But Tommy also had a real soft spot for uh, R&B and soul music and, and roots music. But um, we were so angry. We were so angry as teenagers. You know, it's like we were getting three squares. We were, you know, we lived in suburbia. You know, Tommy was upper middle class and my family was lower middle class. But we were all taken care of. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we were so snide. (laughs) We were just real. Maybe it's a teenage thing. Yeah. But, you know, then we then we find um, what was considered punk rock then, you know, would be like uh, the Ramones and and the jam and things like that. But it was also funny because of that. It was like, (laughs) like, we like punk rock. We like Blondie. (laughs) You know, <laughs> but it it made us uh, uh, freaks, but we really didn't care. Mm-hmm. And uh, no segue here. So I give up my crown. Did you move? <laughs> you don't. You did. You used to live in L.A. and you don't anymore. I live in Los Angeles for thirty five years now. I I I just moved in January. I live in uh, uh, Illinois. I uh, I I am uh, I am very thin here in the midwest <laughs> i uh, <laughs> is that why you moved yeah i my, my body issues I, go, <laughs> I need to i need to move to a county where i'm the daniel craig and uh, i'm the daniel craig of dupage county yeah so i live out in the woods i live on an acre and a half and uh, nice. we have deer and turkeys and a groundhog and two foxes that are always in the yard and uh my cats, uh, I, they sit in the window and uh, it, it's, you know, the, the groundhog, they're really big. Did you know that? Uh, they, I, I wouldn't have thought that, but I only know that from seeing From the movie. <laughs> yeah, but like the, any newscast also where they bring a groundhog oh, yeah. out. It's like, it's like, it's like a beaver a, without a tail. Yeah. And, the, and, and, uh, and Robert Smith and Anderson Cooper and all my cats, they're like, that is the biggest mouse I've ever seen. <laughs> and they lose their minds. So, What prompted the move? Uh, my, my girlfriend's family lives about 25 minutes from us. But, but honestly, two years in a row, we were, we were in our house in Glendale looking at the hill on fire. Hmm. And then during the pandemic, when I, was, I wrote a screenplay and I, and I put together – this movie and I was like, well, I can, I can live anywhere. You know, the editors weren't even in the, you know, I jokingly said, I cannot work from any city, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's obviously you can create. And, and in fact, most of the stuff I've directed recently, not very rarely was it in LA. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just quality of life, you know, do, do you miss it at all? I just was back home. I, my daughter lives there. So and we had a really great time. Uh, but you know, between, uh, I don't, 
I, I miss, obviously, I miss my friends, but I, I don't miss the traffic and I don't miss, yeah. you know, I, I look at my whole yard looks, it's all, you know, it's going off right now because of the foliage. <laughs> this, is, this is angry punk rock comedian. <laughs> the colors are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm envious. And how did you meet this lovely lady? Don't worry, I won't be too jealous. I uh, I don't know if I've ever. Oh, you know what? She asked me not to tell the story. Oh, <laughs> but it was. Uh, uh, let's just say I saw her across the room, and uh, and uh, I I uh, I <laughs> actually and I said I'm gonna go talk to my future ex wife. <laughs> <laughs> And she asked you not to tell it because it's too no, personal? No, I don't know why, but this, the, there's a lot of bells and whistles and people involved. So, uh, But I did see her and, 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 and went out of my way to say hi to her. Well, that so, is... Yeah, it's a good story, but it's an off-the-air story. That's so sweet and also very vague. Um, let's take... It's very vague. <laughs> it's so vague. It really brings up a picture that's mostly very faint in my mind i gotta um, tell you when i saw her i didn't see anyone else at that point it was just that it was like that kind of getting hit over the head with an anvil oh that is so sweet let's take a quick another quick break and then we're going to come back and take some questions from listeners i need to talk to you guys about rothy's it's 2021 and no one has time for uncomfortable shoes tony do you have time for uncomfortable shoes i, I who does no one that's where Rothy's comes in. Uh, the number one word Rothy's customers use to describe their shoes is comfortable. Rothy's shoes are made out of recycled water bottles, which is insane because when I heard that, I thought, well, I don't want crunchy water bottle shoes. And then you feel the shoes, you look at the shoes and they are beautiful and they are, look like they're made out of like very comfortable yet durable fabric. I don't know what kind of magic or alchemy they're doing over there in the Rothy warehouses and factories, but whatever they're doing, they make amazing shoes, super stylish. You can wear them right out of the box. No blisters. They come in all these different silhouettes. Um, you are going to, you'll go to the website, you will fall in love, and then you'll order one pair, and then you'll become a, what word would I use to describe? A Rothy's head? You'll become a total, I was going for something like more fancy, but yes, you'll become a real Rothy's head and then you'll start collecting them. It's inevitable. So think trade about that. Trade with your friends. What'd you say? Trade with your friends. Collect you, them. Trade with your friends. That's right. Like a sticker club. Yeah. Um. Yes. It'll you pretty much clear your schedule because you're about to become <laughs> obsessed with Rothy's you'll be part of a Rothy's community. I mean, we're joking, but we're not because that's how enthusiastic you will be about them. And also, Tony, I know you know this. They aren't just for women anymore. They now sell men's sneakers and men's driving loafers. Rothy's men's line features the same level of craftsmanship as Rothy's women's line. Durable, washable. Did I mention they're washable? In you did the just wash now. I, I mean... I know I mentioned it. I felt like maybe I mentioned it at the top as well. You can put them in your washing machine. This is the kind of stuff you'll be talking about with your new Rothy's head friends. Um, they're better for the planet, rigorously tested for a perfect fit, wash after wash. To help you welcome the fall season in style, Rothy's is doing something special. That's right. They gave us the chance to share this super rare opportunity with our listeners and Tony for a limited time. Right now, you can get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash Allison. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash Allison. Head to rothys.com slash Allison to find your new favorites today. All right, and we're back. Okay, so I am on Patreon, patreon.com slash Allison Rosen. Bonus episodes Patreon. Are the friend zone. There's a level where you can text me and I'll text you back. You can watch videos of the Thursday show. This The video of this show is on YouTube, youtube.com slash Allison Rosen. So go there and see what we look like. Uh, you can see Bobcat's hat. <laughs> and you have quite, you have a lot of facial hair going on too. Yeah, I, I, like, I'm, I'm getting ready for the Randy Quaid biopic. <laughs> <laughs> you see all of like. that see the spot yeah. on the wall where the picture of me could have been <laughs> um and you can submit questions for guests i love it questions for guests all sorts of stuff patreon.com slash allison rosen if you sign up for a year you get two months free 12 months for the price of 10 uh 
Okay, so we I solicited questions. I have questions from Patreon and on Twitter. Let's answer some. Questions from our fans. Okay. BS in Education podcast asks, and I don't know what this is referring to, so I hope you do. How awesome is Amy Pearson Mendez? <laughs> she's great. She's my, she's one of my best friends. Amy uh, is the AD. She's the first assistant director and second and third, and she's produced a lot of the movies that I, I, I've said and that I've made, and and uh, uh, she's always involved in everything I make, and she is the best. She's really great, and she's uh, she also works with my brother Jimmy, who's a first AD. So she's the Goldthwait whisperer. Like, <laughs> like she's always like steering us. Uh, yeah, she's she's the best. So nice. she's the one that, like I say, I'm going to go make a movie about Bigfoot, and she says, "Yes, that's a great idea." <laughs> and then she's camping out in the middle of the woods with me and some Bigfoot enthusiasts. And so yeah, I, every, uh, everyone needs an Amy Pearson Mendez in their life. It sounds like. yeah, yeah, she's the best. Uh, Tammy H says, Allison and Bob, did you ever find out how slash why there were people at Allison's live show with Bobcat Goldthwait masks? I know the answer to that. And Bob, how are you doing with your grief for Robin Williams? Oh, uh, with the, with, you know, I think like when you, you lose a friend, um, like that, or you kind of go, you think of it like, oh, I have, I'm missing an arm and I'm never going to grow that arm back. I'm just going to get used to it. But what happens is sometimes when you're having fun or you're experiencing joy, you feel like you're betraying that person that's gone. Mm -hmm. So it had to take me a while to realize that person would want me to be happy. And that's a cliche, but it's true. That person would want me to be happy. That person would be very sad if I was sad. And I had to get past the idea that I could carry on with my life and have fun mm -hmm. and not be, uh, and, and, and feel full again. You know, I thought I, like I said, I really thought it was just going to be this piece that was missing, but every once in a while it'll be something. And I think about them every day and every once in a while something might trigger something and I get really sad and everything. But, you know, it's funny. There's a, there's a, a meme that floats around with him and I get, speaking of getting sent things, I get sent this thing and it's a quote, it's a picture of Robin and the quote is, I used to think the worst thing in life is ending up all alone. It's not the worst thing in life is ending up with people that make you feel all alone. Mm. That's what he said in the movie World's Greatest Dad. Robin didn't say that. He had, he had his, his business people that loved him, his wife, his kids, you know, and he had people like me in his life. So, you know, he, he died from Louis body dementia, which was misdiagnosed as Parkinson's. And it's a horrible way to die. And uh, he, he was getting misinformation and he wouldn't have come back. But, you know, mm -hmm. people want to make it about depression or alcoholism or drugs. And the fact is, is he beat depression. He had beaten alcohol and drugs. This was a, uh, this was a horrible disease that made his brain Swiss cheese. Yeah. Um, how how many years would you say it took until you felt like you could enjoy life again and experience those things where you didn't feel like you were betraying him? I think it was a long time. You know, I think it was probably at least like three, four years. You know, it wasn't until a, a, a buddy of mine opened up about his sister's suicide it was the first time I got genuine relief, and mm -hmm. we both were 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 cracking horrible jokes, and it and and it was so healing, and and that was one of the greatest gifts, uh, uh, you know, Adam, Kate, and Holland. Actually, it's just the guy. But, oh yeah. But um, you know, it 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 still comes back. But you know, that's the thing. If you end up surviving, I'm 59. You end up ha losing a lot of people. You know, my friend Barry Crimmins that I did the documentary "Call Me Lucky" on. Uh, I was actually there when he. That's not true. I spent the last three four days while he was passing away. But uh, I went out to get some food for his wife, and I really think, even though he was in a coma, that I he was waiting for me to leave so he could have a little private time because his eyes opened up and she said, I love you. Everyone loves you. It's okay. You can go. Mm -hmm. And then he passed away. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, I, I never thought that seeing someone die is a weird, um, it's sad and, and everything. But on the other side, it's again, it's a, it's, it's some kind of weird gift. You know, I actually, that Death. was where during that moment, I definitely, 
had wiggle i make a joke about it but not this situation but that's where i think i went from atheist to agnostic in that mm. moment like i felt like there might be something else here mm-hmm. I, said, I didn't realize we were gonna get so heavy <laughs> um just to stick with the heaviness for for a second though you said that it it's a gift are you talking about death being a gift like release well when i watched it for some reason i kind of believed that there was something else mm-hmm I, and I can't even explain why, um, but it, 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 you know, I felt like Barry had put this this force into the world, and that when he passed away, that this this thing, of course, he wasn't going to be around anymore. But this thing that he set out there was so big that that it wasn't stopped at that moment. Yeah, you know, and uh, and that was it, and and you know, and and. <laughs> It was just, it was Barry, you know, it was, I had to wrestle with him because he was just, he did not want to go. I was physically holding him down on the bed. So it wasn't like in a movie where someone says their last words or, you know, there was no rosebud. If there was a rosebud for Barry Crimmins, it was the word, God damn it. <laughs> that was the last thing he said to me. <laughs> did, when... The fact that it happened while you were out <clears throat> getting food, were you like, God damn it? No, I mean, this is, this makes me sound insensitive, but, but, uh, you know, Helen and his widow hadn't eaten and I went to get food and then I got a text saying, get back here ASAP. And I showed up and Barry was gone and Helen's crying and I have the sandwiches and I go, what I miss? <laughs> and... <laughs> As I'm saying it, I was like, I can't believe you're saying this. And then another part of my voice went, Barry would really, really laugh at this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that makes you sound insensitive. Well, but then we were laughing and the doctors come by and there was, we, you know, we were like those kind of laughs where you're crying. We were mm-hmm. laughing and they're going, these two ghouls, what is going on? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. um, oh, and... Yes, I did a, a show at Meltdown, <clears throat> Nerd, at Nerd Melt, the uh, uh, no longer there Nerd Melt comics. And there were people in the audience who had made homemade Bobcat Goldthwait masks, which like with little <laughs> slits for eyes. It was actually so, very creepy, but also yeah, that would be really creepy. funny. <laughs> but Tammy, were you there or do you just did I talk about it? I can't remember. But anyway, they made those masks because it came up on the Adam Carolla show that I had a crush on you. At a show that you were at, and I rem- I think we've, we've probably been through this, but I remember thinking, ha ha, I can laugh this off. And then when it came up, I was like, I feel so mortified right now. I want to like crawl inside oh. a hole in the ground. I feel so embarrassed because oh. you were right there. Yeah. Well, uh, if, uh, yeah, if it makes you feel any better, that happens to my shows a lot. <laughs> Come in with masks. Mask. Me, no, that sounds like a horror movie. That sounds <laughs> terrible. It was, it was funny. Um, okay, Lisa Lowry says, "What were the last three songs you listened to?" Oh, and uh, you can choose which one or both. And what are the contents of your nightstand? Uh, it's interesting. The last song I was listening to was, uh, I don't remember the other two, but it was "Great Leap Forward" by Billy Bragg, which always cheers me up. Uh, I'm trying to think what else came up on. I just have my, uh, I'm just on shuffle, but, uh, what else was there? I think that was the one that re- remember. And on my nightstand is my CPAP, which, oh, uh, really? Yeah, that ought to crush any, uh, cr- crush, <laughs> crush on any you. Crush. It's a, it's a mouthpiece and it's the CPAP and yeah. it's, it's horrendous. It's like you wake up and it's like a, uh, yeah, uh, you're being assaulted by a robot. Uh, it's the worst feeling. I Did you have, that up. To, have to do a sleep study to get? <laughs> yeah, your yeah. And was that go, as miserable as I imagine it? Oh, it was just they go. Oh, you stopped breathing 127 times. And I was like, oh, I guess I need this. But, but you know, I know. I not you know, look, when I'm on a plane, more than once I've woken up and I was adjusting my nuts. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I can't there's no way I, I wasn't rubbing my balls while this poor woman was watching me in another room. But I guess that probably happens all the time. I I would assume that <laughs> comes with the job. Isn't that someone else who's supposed to say that to you? <laughs> Don't what, worry it, about it. It probably happens all the time. 
<laughs> well, but yeah, I mean, I was just, I'm sure I was going to town scratching my taint <laughs> while this poor woman is being paid to watch. <laughs> it probably does happen all the time. Okay. She, she comes in and puts a pillow over my face. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, okay. On Twitter, Ken Scar says, ask him about his Bono impression. I saw him do it at the end of one of his shows in the 80s and it was unreal. Well, but yeah, I, I, I'd say I was a little pitchy dog, but thanks. Uh, so I did, and years ago, I did an impression of Bono, and then uh, I, I got a call from him, and it was very nice. And it was oh, before wow. people were doing impressions of him, so it was brand new, and he was... And so uh, Joel, my buddy Joel Murray and I went to see them at Angel Stadium, and I was in the 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 stadium uh doorway and and i'm talking to him and he's saying really nice things and we're you know mutual compliments to each other and he was very kind and then he starts walking away and he takes off those sunglasses the fly sunglasses and he goes hey bobcat and he throws them to me and i catch him and i say thanks mean joe and it's such a good <laughs> Because there's that Coca-Cola commercial where the I Mean Joe Green throws his jersey to the little kid. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it went over as well as it did with you guys. I was, like, that, I was like, that was a really good joke and it just fell deaf on his Gaelic ears. But yeah. So, but now that uh, I know the reference and I remember it, yeah, it thanks, really would have gone over well. I don't know, but I, I I thought it was a pretty good riff because actually it was even framed like the commercial it was in the yeah. stadium, and he, he turned around. So I have those. I have a pair of his glasses uh, that um, <laughs> that my years ago my Yorkie Sid Vicious chewed up, which I thought <laughs> kind of made sense. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> Brent asks: Was there a period where you felt like you couldn't get good acting work unless you did your signature voice persona? If so, what was that like? Well, I think. I don't know if I got any good acting work doing that, but I, <laughs> I, I definitely made a decision that uh, I didn't want to be in front of the camera. Uh, and I, I, I did one role. I remember I was on the uh, 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 SC. Uh, what was it? The Vegas CSI or whatever is that? It. The, it's a show out now. They rebooted it. Uh, NCI I'm, or I don't know what. There is an NC. Yeah, NCIS. So. And I'm like the comedian who's a murderer, <laughs> and I and I do it all straight, you know. And I'm like, and I'm I'm acting very serious and heavy, and people were like, "Man, that was really good." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm out." <laughs> this is so ridiculous. And it was my friend Eric Idle who said, "You know, you don't have to go on these auditions when they ask you." And I was like, I had never even thought of that. Yeah. So I stopped going, and it was so freeing. It was so freeing, you know. In the in 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 Joyride, I say to uh, at a commencement speech, but I I actually trimmed out the end of it, and I wish I hadn't. I say mm. it's important to keep quitting, you know, it, always quit. Uh, but the end of that is is because it's so foreign. Don't quit, you know. It's right. Like, quit, quit all the time until you end up someplace you don't want to leave, and that's the part where I left off. And Right now, the part is I, I get to tell stories on stage. I get to, and I get to make movies and tell stories behind the camera. And I really, I think people that don't believe you when you say you love to be behind the camera. I think they think it's like where an actor goes when they can't get mm -hmm. jobs. But I love being a director. Um, why did you trim that the the sincere ending out? I don't know. There's a lot of cuts in the thing where at some there was a reason why. Maybe it was just too too corny. I don't know. But there was like there's a clip where Kurt Cobain is talking about yeah. me, and then h him and Chris are being nice about me, and then and then the the drummer at the time, Chad, goes, uh, "I think uh, I think he's a nice guy, but I don't think he's funny." <laughs> I don't think yeah. he's funny at all. And then Kurt looks at him like he's going to kill him. But the reality of it is, is Kurt actually says, you're the next to go. <laughs> but I cut that out because I felt this poor guy is already the Pete Best of <laughs> right. uh, Nirvana. I didn't need to dogpile. But then I told tell, tell the story on your show, so I guess I still am. But, you know, trims are made back and forth. I felt like I wanted to make sure this thing was not 
too long, so I was uh, I did a lot of pull ups, mm-hmm. um, just because again it's comedy, so I didn't want you to be like you know looking at your watch when you watch it. And the nice thing that's happened is so many people will tell me that they've already watched it multiple times, so that's pretty neat. Yeah, uh, you in 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 Joyride, you talk about hating fame. You hated being famous. Well, I hated being famous for just being famous. You know, I, I, I was a spectacle. I'm also hiding behind this persona. I'm not myself. So people think they know me and they, they just know this persona. My stepson would just like, when he was little, he would go, <laughs> he would just say, uh, he would just be so mad when people came up. He would say, he, he can't see you when he's on TV. Uh, or, or he says he doesn't know you. Like he'd be really defensive. So I always had, like, I remember once there's a clip of me smashing up the Arsenio Hall mm-hmm. show that's in the movie. But that night I was coloring with my daughter and she was probably eight or nine. And Eric Idle's daughter, Lily, is a really good friend. And Eric and Tasha, my daughter, are really good friends. And, but, uh, the news comes on and goes, comedian goes berserk on the Arsenio Hall show. <laughs> and, uh, my daughter goes, oh, I go, what's wrong? She goes, sometimes you act like you don't have a brain in your head. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, it's just comedy. And she goes, if it was just comedy, it wouldn't be on the news. Lily's dad's not on the news, <laughs> which which I thought would be funny. Eric Idle smashing up a <laughs> talk show. When you were smashing it up, were you thinking like, oh, this is going to make the news. This is going to. I mean, you were no. going viral before viral. Yeah. No, I didn't think it was going to make the news. I just kind of thought it was funny. And w- this sounds quasi uh, uh, pretentious, but sometimes I was doing these things on shows and I'd have like a plan kind of mapped out. Mostly how was I going to get out of the building when they called security? <laughs> but, but um, you know, there was like bits I did that were actual bits. And then I just kind of, I just thought it was funny to 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 not know where this was going uh you know i mean like if you if you ask pete townsend he'll tell you that he was doing some form of pop art when mm-hmm. he smashed the guitar but at the end of the day he is an angry guy and he smashed a guitar and everyone that went crazy and it was awesome so uh it's both me it's just yeah I, i'm sure i had i was tr- like i say in the movie i was trying to end my career but it didn't work it actually suddenly regis and Kathy Lee are asking me on because I said yeah. that the night's on fire. It was really weird. But Jay Leno was was actually mad at you, right? Yeah, he was really mad. But then he had me on like the following week. People think like like you know again when I ego surf, it'll be like com- people who are banned from talk shows. It's like no, I was on the next week. You know? Yeah. But you know Leno, and he had right to be mad at me. But it was funny. He called the. I pick up the phone. And he doesn't say hello. He goes, eh, eh, Leno. Like, <laughs> he just says, Leno. And I was like, hey, how you doing? He's like, so was David Letterman a good guy? And I'm a bad guy? And I'm like, I don't know you either of you personally, but from where I stand, you're both fucking crazy. <laughs> and he laughed at that. He, but he said, he goes, what would you do if I came over to your house and set it on fire? I said, well, that would be weird because I did it on a, a show you work on I mean, to, <laughs> to your house. You know, I I think I'm perceived as crazy, but I think I've always had a little bit more healthier version of knowing what was showbiz Mm -hmm. and what was reality. And my heroes were people like Andy Kaufman or Alice Cooper or Groucho Marx. You know, even as a kid, I knew Groucho Marx could walk erect. (laughs) They They didn't walk like a duck. Right. Um. Okay. Ask him, <clears throat> this is someone whose screen name is just a bunch of dots, but it's a real person. Ask him about how that hilarious story that he told in One Crazy Summer about the little fat kid came about. I've always been curious if he or a writer came up with it, but I think about that monologue at least once a week because it's so funny. Oh, that's sweet. I Yeah, that speech is uh, Savage Steve Holland told me the origin of that was I go, hey, I have this idea for a scene. And he said, well, if. You can just shoot it in one setup and we could do it in this garage. We could film it. So, so yeah, I, I wrote that scene. But, uh, so yeah, that was the scene that I wrote. And, 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 but it wasn't until we were doing the commentary recently that I, I realized there's a lot of stuff in that movie. There's a, there's a scene that's playing in a drive in 
a movie called Hemorrhoids from Hell or something like that. <laughs> and it's so it's so I directed that segment and uh, I don't even, and I'm not I don't even remember because I don't I didn't think of myself as director at the time but I had a second unit and I had smoke machines and chainsaws and it was backlit and it was all this stuff and and Steve Holland came over and he goes I want to be on your movie. <laughs> <laughs> it had all these special effects and stuff. <laughs> So I didn't even know I wanted to direct when I did. But when I was a little boy, I would look at a movie poster and I would not look at the star. I wouldn't look at the tagline. I would always go to who wrote and directed it. So it was funny. When Tom Kenny and I were little kids, Tom loved Mel Blanc. And he had a picture of Mel Blanc in his locker later in high school. And I had a picture of Mel Brooks. And I should have known then that that's what I wanted to do. What do you love about directing? I don't think it's... uh, I, I, you know, I don't think it's more humble. I think it's almost probably a bigger ego. But, you know, when, when you, I would say this, like when I'm directing a special of somebody and you can make them feel comfortable and they can do their best work, that, that's awesome. And when you, when you put this whole thing together and, and it, and it connects with people, you know, my, my movies don't connect with mass popularity, but, you know, when it does connect with people, I don't make popular movies, but I make some people's favorite movies. Mm-hmm. You know, there'll be someone's like, dude, I love Shakes the Clown. And then they go, I hated that Bigfoot movie. What do you, you know, so <laughs> I love that my fans from movie to movie, I lose them. I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to challenge myself. You know, can I make a suspenseful movie? Can I make a documentary? Can I do this? Can I be in a movie that I, you know, that was the, the joyride thing. I didn't know if I could do that. So, and was that challenging? Yeah, because I had to I had to step back and 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 be willing to make myself look unpleasant and also make sure that it was balanced and not all about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And some cuts it was all about Dana and then, and that was all and then vice versa other cuts it was all about me and then I I think I finally landed on a pretty good medium where you get the idea that we're two friends and you see our families and you see our fights and you see our 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 fights with ourselves in our heads and mm-hmm. uh, i hope i mean people like it it's actually uh uh it's it's been getting really good reviews it's, i loved uh, it oh thanks man thanks and greg sirota what do you miss most about your hometown of syracuse new york uh salt potatoes uh, people don't know what those are. I, I have a salt potato tattoo. That's uh, <laughs> you take a you take a, a, a tiny those small potatoes and you boil it in about a half a pound of salt and it gets all crusty and then you dip it in butter and uh, they're they're only in my hometown. You can make them anywhere, but it's a it's a Syracuse delicacy. Salt potatoes, and if you can't boil a potato and a half pound of salt and put butter on it you could just have someone punch you in the chest <laughs> right in the heart and you would be like i really thought i was gonna die after eating a plate of salt potatoes it felt like buddy rich was tuning a, a t- snare drum on my chest <laughs> but obviously i missed my my sisters i i saw them uh, a few times this year uh, i still go back to my hometown all the time you know and and sometimes people will be like will we'll reach out and act like I, I've distanced myself from my hometown. It's like, no, I go back to my hometown and I experience my hometown. I don't go back to my hometown as the local boy made good. Come see my show. You know? <laughs> That's gross. And then uh, lastly for the questions, Matt Shields wants to know, does the voice hurt? It hurts other people. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think, yeah, it, you know, did it hurt? Yeah, probably, you know, but, but, uh, uh, you know, it's been so many years since I've done it. Like, even when I do it, like, as I'm telling a story, mm-hmm. I'll talk, I'll do it. It's not, it's a version of it. You know, I, I tell a story about meeting Grover, uh, when I was directing <laughs> Kimmel and I was like, I, the most starstruck I've ever been. <laughs> I saw the guy put Grover on. I, I knew it was, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, he's like, hi, Bobcat. And, uh, and, and, and I, in my head, I'm like, Ah, uh, Grover knows my name. Grover knows my name. <laughs> I was like, remember, remember when you were near and then you were far and then you were near and far again? <laughs> you know, and then I, I was thinking that 
I clearly owe the Henson Corporation some money because this is the voice. Like I, I saw Grover, you know, can you go to ten? It's like <laughs> it's the same. It's the same act, man. Right. <laughs> and I think that was kind of it. You know, I would say my the persona I did was arrested to a certain degree. Yeah. All right. So let's do just me or everyone. Is it just me or everyone? Okay. Do you have one? I do. And it's it, it, it takes place in two places. I'll be on an escalator and and it's usually a senior citizen is ahead of me. And in the back of my head, I'm like going, just hit him in the head. Hit him in the head. <laughs> and I'm a nonviolent person. I'm never going to hit them in the head. But that's what I think when I see them. I, I'll be there and I'll go, oh, I'm just, you could just get a clean shot right into grandpa's head. <laughs> And sometimes the same thought will come to me when someone comes, reaches, like leans over in the car for directions. Like they'll go, like uh, you know, if someone, if someone leans over to my car and to talk to me for mm-hmm. directions, I just, I just want to punch him in the face and drive off. <laughs> <laughs> and I have that thought. By the way, I have that thought all the time. If I'm on an escalator and I'm behind you, I'm trying not to hit you in the head. <laughs> so it's not just a senior citizen; it's anyone. No, it's usually seniors. Though. Okay, I just think it'd be funny just, uh, just, just to hit an old guy right in the back of the head randomly, just because. Also, <laughs> it's just a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you shared this. This is truly the spirit of just mere everyone. I don't personally have this one. Sometimes with little fragile animals, yeah. I have the thought of like. They could just be snapped. Like, look yeah. how they're, it's like, a, it's a, it's an outgrowth of how fragile they are, I think. And then I like, I'm like, why am I thinking that? Why is this? It's like an intrusive thought almost. Like, yeah, I have no it, temptation to do it. It's just an awareness. It's when you're on a, it's when you're on a building and you're on the lip of it and you're like, I could just jump. And yeah. you, you know, you're fighting with your brain about, no, don't jump. So, but <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, but mine's a little violent. I just want to. <laughs> Yeah. Punch your, your grandma or grandpa in the back of the head on an escalator. And I cannot not have that thought. Tony, do you have that thought? <laughs> I can't say that I have. Yeah. The, 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 the thought about jumping, you know, from my, like you were just mentioning, I feel like that's the closest equivalent of that that I have. But yeah, no, no, no punching temptations. I was in a hotel room. I can't, I, I can't remember what city it was in, but I had to like, close the sliding glass door and lock it because I didn't trust myself on the balcony. Yeah. And I don't yeah. normally have it that extreme, but there was something about that balcony and I just like the height of it. And I could not get the thought out of my head. Yeah. I think it's the, that's, that's the people who have uh fear of heights is that, but, wait, but I don't have that when I, I get, I have definitely, I can get claustrophobic when I'm, uh, uh, well, actually, I get claustrophobic when I'm in a cave scuba diving. That 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 that's an easy tear. Would you story. actually scuba dive? Yeah, I was scuba diving with my daughter, and this uh, uh, former Navy SEAL takes us out, and so he points the turtles. He does the sign language for turtles. And we swim over the turtles, and then he points fish, and he, and we swim over the fish, and then he goes like this, he gives a sign for shark, mm-hmm. and I swim over the shark. And then I look and the rest of the, and nobody else went. I'm the only one. And now I'm about 12 feet from a shark oh who turns around. It was just, and I, I didn't want to swim away. I kind of back pedal. I don't know. I just didn't want to look like a delicious Snap. seal. Yeah. Taken. Yeah. So, so, so the Navy SEAL guy goes up, you know, so we get out of the water, take our masks off. And he goes, why did you swim to the shark? And my daughter goes, my dad's been swimming towards the shark his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> he points at the shark and goes, hey, all right, I get to see the shark. Yeah, another thing to look at. Um, that sounds terrifying. Is scuba diving fun? I, I, it, it's definitely not for me. Yeah, I like scuba diving because when you're doing it, you, you're concentrating on breathing and and you're wa- seeing all this amazing stuff. So your brain can't go anywhere else mm-hmm. or you better not. And I love that. It's the same reason why I love to go out in my backyard and I – I chop wood. I chop a lot of wood. Uh, that's not a euphemism for something, but I, I go out there and I chop a, a, a ton of wood and I fell trees with my chainsaw. And uh, I'm on a take group, you to forest life. I'm, I'm, I'm on a group text with Tom Kenny and he's like, you guys 
Bobcat shouldn't have a chainsaw. This isn't even funny. I don't think you understand. Like, he's really upset. But, like, I'll be doing a Zoom meeting and I'm sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh. I got that new axe. That new axe came from Amazon. I got to go out there and get that axe going. So I have three axes. Wow. <laughs> Do you have a shed for all your garden tools? Yeah, I have a, I have the murder shed. It's probably like <laughs> 70 years old. And I, I, I bought one of those custom wood signs that says, uh, it says, the Gein family. And it's, <laughs> that's above my shed. <laughs> and my daughter called me the other day. She's like, Dad, why didn't you call it Shed Gein? She's like, <laughs> she's like, it was right there. And lastly, <clears throat> do you have a hey go fuck yourself? Yeah, I, I, uh, it's what I touched upon earlier. Anybody who's whining about, uh, uh, there being a cancel culture, uh, uh, you know, they can, uh, they can go. <laughs> I would say the people, <laughs> oh, wait, let me do it right. So I, I find it like, uh, people trying to pretend that they're victims because they can't be bigoted anymore. Uh, the, those kind of babies that are whining about the culture culture. So, uh, I would say, uh, people who act like victims because of cancel culture can go. Hey, 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 go fuck yourself. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Thank you so much for being on the show. I always love catching up with you. Uh, this was no exception. Everyone go out, watch Joyride. It is streaming everywhere now. Um, t- plug anything you'd like to plug. Tell them where they can find you, etc. Oh, that's it. Joyride and uh, and is on like iTunes or Amazon, anywhere you can stream stuff. And uh, the other stuff. I'm just on Instagram. I uh, you won't see me on uh, <laughs> fighting with strangers on Twitter. That made me laugh. Somebody <laughs> direct messaged me. He goes, "I can't believe I'm arguing with Bobcat Goldthwait on Twitter." And I'm like, "I can't believe it either because I'm not on Twitter." <laughs> uh, all right. Well, so good to see you guys. So good. Um, if you enjoyed what you're hearing, please make sure to leave us a nice comment on Apple Podcasts. That helps out the show five stars. Please, that's my favorite uh, number. Uh, I'll plug- I'll plug bizarre albums. I, I love it. I love I love Tony's podcast. It's a, one of the few podcasts I listen to. I love it. Thank I you. can't wait when it drops. Thank you, thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Follow Always, me on social media at Allison Rosen on Twitter and Instagram. Tony, what about you? Well, he already did half of it. Uh, so yeah, just twi- <laughs> Twitter and Instagram at Tony Thaxton. And uh, yeah, those episodes <laughs> are every Tuesday. And the Motion City Soundtrack Tour is coming up uh, less than two months away suddenly. It seemed forever away, and now here we are. So get those tickets if you haven't gotten those yet. Awesome. Thank you, Bobcat. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I love you. You matter. Goodbye. Hey, do you know about the Allison Rosen Show? 